Hello, hello. I hope everyone can hear me. If you can, maybe just say hi, Marin, or something in the chat so I can see it. But I think we are now live with our Ignite Talk session uh, four. Uh, hi, Marin. Excellent. Nice to see you all here. Uh, we are going to get started here because we have so much great stuff to show you. I am Marin Vernon. I am a learning resource designer here at Scratch. And today I have the pleasure of bringing you talks from around the globe on four topics. So we'll be hearing about energizing social studies through Scratch integration, creating pathways to inclusion in K-12 CS education, the PRIM model using Scratch to gauge student understanding, and spotting a microaggression, an interactive social story in Scratch. I think you're gonna love these sessions. They're great. I got to preview them before. Uh, as you listen to these talk recordings, please feel free to jot down your questions that come to mind. And after the four recordings have played, we'll have about 20 to 30 minutes for a QA session with the presenters who are able to join us live. And I think most of them are uh, going to be able to join us for this session. You can just simply add your questions to the chat. I'll try to get to as many as I can during that. And uh, with that, let's hear from our presenters. Hi, welcome to Energizing Social Studies through Scratch Integration. My name is Cindy Baldacchini, and I'm a curriculum developer at the US-based company, CodeHS. Today, we're going to understand how to use Scratch as an effective learning tool in social studies. And we're going to dig into three lessons that show different ways to use Scratch. So what is social studies? It's more than just history, it's civics, cultural awareness, geography, and timelines. We're going to look at three lessons, a model of the US government, and the first image shows that model of the three branches, an interactive map, which can also be used as a timeline, and an interactive game to explore culture. Scratch is great for making social studies dynamic and exciting and meeting your students where they are. If your students currently create posters, slides, and maybe essays, they can express that same learning dynamically by creating animations, games, and interactive quizzes. So what's the best way to use Scratch? Start with your learning objective. This is different than the US-based learning standard. It is what you want your students to produce. What artifact will they create? And then clarify what your students will create. For example, if they're gonna make a quiz, will it be a multiple choice quiz or maybe an open-ended quiz? And then lastly, set your schedule based on how many class periods you have available to teach computer science. Best practices, no matter what your schedule is, is to use short instructional videos and GIFs. These are videos your students can pause, they can rewind and rewatch, and you can share those videos with students who are absent, which really makes a difference. Target one new computer science skill for each social studies lesson. So if you're going to use an end of the unit assessment, just one new CS skill, and then provide starter code to differentiate so that students who are newer to computer science don't get overwhelmed. Here's our first lesson we're going to look at, the model of the US government. This is an animation that shows the three branches of the US government and a white scroll moving between the branches. The scroll starts out with a bill, and then changes to law. The best practices that this lesson uses are graphic organizers, videos, and starter code. Here's a link to the lesson. You will be able to open this and review the lesson in detail. But the computer science concept we explore is the if else conditional in Scratch. And you can see an example, if the user answers one way, the program animates one way. If another answer is used, a different action happens. Here's the second lesson we're gonna look at, an interactive map of the 13 colonies. Your students will write one or two sentences about the colonies to show their learning, and then the user will move through the map, highlighting each date and learning more about the colonies. Computer science concepts taught, if else conditionals and variables. The best practices used in this lesson are to use comments to help guide students. 
These comments can act almost like a how-to guide for your students. We also provide a detailed example. We complete the entire first date for your students. This is a big, complicated program, and we want to scaffold it to support students who are newer to CS. Keep using the graphic organizers. They are very helpful in social studies. The last lesson we're going to take a look at is the interactive game to learn about culture. The example uses Japanese culture and the user clicks through different questions. Depending on how the user answers a question, they get a different output. They get a different result. It's a great way to review inputs and outputs. The main computer science concepts are broadcast messages and decomposition. Best practices that this lesson uses are providing a detailed example. We provide the Japanese example, and then your students would program whatever culture they're researching in, in your social studies class. We use the videos to guide the students, give them plenty of time to be creative, and explicitly teach the concept of decomposition. If you're interested in an elementary curriculum, please let us know. We do offer a complete K-12 solution for schools and districts. Hi, I'm Alexis Kobo. This is my Ignite Talk, Creating Pathways to Inclusion in K-12 CS Education. I am a research fellow at CS for All and a doctoral candidate at the University of Florida. And part of this work is from my dissertation research. So today I'm gonna to share a little bit about the problem of practice in equity and inclusion that is happening in CS education. At first, K-12 computer science education lacks consistency in access, equity, and inclusion for students in historically marginalized groups, particularly students with disabilities. And the research has demonstrated a need for high quality teacher professional development, or PD, to support the inclusion of students with disabilities in K-12 CS education. Therefore, that led me to explore how the development of a professional learning community or PLC with the following goals. One, allow participants to network with individuals with an equity focused mindset. Two, experience tools, practices, and strategies to leverage learner variability. Could three, develop definitions for inclusion to address barriers to the inclusion of students with disabilities in CS education. So the context for this has been the Scratch Educator Meetup. Starting on the left of the screen, there's an image to demonstrate how bringing together a global audience, all virtual, with the meetup focused on equity, inclusion, and accessibility could then lead to, in the center, exploring and learning how to leverage inclusive frameworks and pedagogies to meet learner variability. And then finally, how these participants are sharing and reflecting how to incorporate what they learned at the meetup into their practice to hopefully increase student outcomes. There's a very popular illustration and a way that we can address a pathway to inclusion that takes the concept from Resnick and Silverman of wide walls, low floors, high ceilings, and re-engineers it with the ideas of low floors with ramps. That's not just an entry point, but actual inclusion for designing access to technologies, high ceilings with tall ladders, which is in, in order to provide the opportunity for children to maximize their potential, scaffolded and explicit instruction with necessary, wide walls with frames of interest, which accounts for the range of learner variability, supporting students' specific interests within those wide walls and allowing for personalization and creative expression within the computing process. And finally, these reinforced corners or the point of reinforcement to support learner variability where high ceiling walls, high ceilings and wide walls intersect. So this is sort of the crux of the pathway to inclusion. So I wanted to just briefly share an example of a look inside what happens at our meetup. There's a session where we'd create together and we explore uh, questions and critical thinking together and we use 
things like the scratch lab with the high color contrast blocks to test and iterate together. We explore various topics, such as in this example, we have um, some themes that emerged around accessibility, family support, how to promote inclusion, how we define inclusion, and tools to support blind and visually impaired students. And finally, we reflect together on what we learned at the meetup. So join our meetup. Here's a link to our meetup. And if you click on the center in the purple, you can join us at https bit.ly slash scratch ed creating pathways. I hope to see you there. Thanks so much. Hi everybody, and welcome to this Ignite talk on using Prim and Scratch to gauge student understanding. My name is Drew Eastlake, and I'm an educator from Grok Academy. We're a not-for-profit organization based out of Australia. Hi everyone, I'm Sujata Gunja, also an educator at Grok, and it's great to be here. So what we want to do is an acknowledgement of country. It's an act of respect towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the First Nations peoples of Australia. Uh, we at Grok Academy are committed to working with and reconciling with First Nations peoples around the world. We wish to acknowledge the ongoing physical and spiritual connection of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on the lands from which Drew and I are presenting from today. So in this Ignite session, what we'd like to do is explore what the PRIM pedagogy is and how it can be used by educators to help students develop a, a much deeper understanding of code in Scratch. So Scratch is often said to have low floors, high ceiling and wide walls. And low floors allow students to begin without any prior experience, but high ceilings enable students to really be able to develop their expertise over time. The wide walls allow students to have an opportunity to personalize and really express themselves when they're using Scratch. However, the creative affordances of Scratch don't always get used. So if you look at a 2018 analysis of public Scratch projects, this study shows that the use of more sophisticated programming constructs like control loops is quite low. So the vast majority of these projects never actually progress to the use of more complex structures. So the question for us is, how can students demonstrate their understanding of code in Scratch and be guided a little bit higher towards the ceiling? The print pedagogy has five parts and it enables teachers to scaffold how students learn programming. It's said that the most creative work happens where there are constraints, and PRIM provides a great way to support the creativity in Scratch with constraints by helping students focus on small pieces of the puzzle, and we're going to show you an example. So let's begin with the predict stage. When you learn a language, you don't start by writing, and coding is no different. We want students to be able to learn to read code, and one of the best ways to do that is by predicting what's going to happen. There's no expectation and there's no pressure to immediately get syntax right. We want students to be able to gauge their own understanding of what's happening by predicting using visual cues, that's blocks, color, indentation, the sequence of the instructions, and any prior experiences that they may bring to their own learning, while they're also communicating their explanation and understanding of what they see in front of them. Then we get to the run stage, and in the run stage, students simply run the code sample and determine whether they were right or wrong with their prediction and why they may have gotten it wrong. This is where Scratch providing code can be really helpful in the C inside. Students should be expected to be able to create, not create their own code here because no ownership is no stress. Then after they've predicted and then they've run their sample, they're going to start to investigate and they're going to start to look through their code and you as a facilitator are really going to be able to guide the investigation of this code sample by delving deeper into these interactions between these different code structures and all the different blocks that they're going to be using. This is the bulk of where you're going to start to challenge misconceptions and reinforce understandings of the function of the various code blocks. We can do this by doing a bunch of activities in pairs, in groups, in ways that suit your particular learning context and encourage communication, collaboration, and confidence. In the modify stage, the remix feature of the Scratch platform really starts to shine. This is where students take existing code and support it with ideas and activities to make it their own. So the teacher has a really important role to play here. Students often start with cosmetic modifications, changing the background, changing the color, um, changing what sound a sprite might make, but are guided towards much more functional modifications. So we're really starting to change the behavior of the code. This helps them test their understanding and experiment in small, 
safe and progressive ways, really encouraging a little bit of risk taking. And finally, in the make stage, this is where students get to create something that's their own. They create new projects, but using similar code structures. So the same six or seven blocks from the previous code example, but combining, combining them in a way to solve a different problem. By providing these constraints, it enables students to take what they've learned and explore it to a greater depth. It helps them increase their confidence because it makes them more comfortable by building on previous learning. And the, the prim scaffolding essentially aims to reduce students' cognitive burden by slowing down and slowly introducing ownership of code. And Scratch features including the see inside, remix and create really help encourage this. We do have a number of resources for further ex exploration, uh, which we will link to. And there's also a series of small Scratch projects that you may be interested in that really do help elaborate on what we've discussed today. But we are Grok Academy. We're an Australian not-for-profit whose aim is to educate all learners in computing skills. And we'd love to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Harita Suresh. And my name is Sharda Suresh. We're glad you could all be here for our presentation on spotting a microaggression. We'd like to begin by discussing what microaggressions are. Microaggressions are the thinly veiled instances of racism, homophobia, and sexism which we see in our daily life. Oftentimes, both the offender and the victim never notice that there is something fundamentally wrong in a microaggressive statement. However, the harmful message conveyed can have a lasting impact on the victim. In fact, research indicates that microaggressions are linked to low self-esteem, increased stress levels, emotional exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Children are quite influenced by the behaviors shown by parents, close family, and peers. Due to this, they may unintentionally learn microaggressive behaviors, as they are too young to differentiate between right and wrong. As a result, children continue to exhibit these behaviors even as they grow older. Our game, Spotting a Microaggression, aims to show children numerous scenarios in which a certain comment or gesture can make someone feel hurt by attacking parts of their identity. This allows them to learn why microaggressions are harmful. We believe it is easier for children to learn from situational stories instead of lectures, and we know that Scratch is the best medium to convey these stories. Now, let's start our demo. Our game opens up to the home screen, where we see a play button. When we click this play button, we're transported into the first scene. The scene takes place in the hallways of Little Apple Academy, where our main character, Anita, is walking. Hey, Anita. Oh, hey, Andy. Whoa, you're really tall. Thanks, I guess. It must be hard to find a boyfriend. Is this a microaggression? I believe that it is. Insulting someone's height can be considered a microaggression for several reasons including 1. Body shaming. Body shaming involves criticizing or mocking someone's body, which can lead to self-esteem issues and body image issues. 2. Height-based discrimination. The comment made in this scenario assumes that being tall is undesirable or negative. Let's move on to the next scene. Hey Olivia, come here. Oh my gosh, your hair is so cool. Can I touch it? Um, thanks for the compliment, but I don't feel comfortable with that. Oh, come on. Don't be so sensitive. I'm just curious. Is this a microaggression? I think it is. Asking to touch someone's hair, even when they ask you not to, can be considered a microaggression for several reasons, including objectification. It reduces the person to an object of curiosity, focusing solely on their physical appearance rather than recognizing them as an individual with boundaries. Two, exoticization. It perpetuates the idea that black hair is exotic or unusual, reinforcing the idea that black hair is different, therefore subject to scrutiny and invasion. Let's move on to our last scene. Jeffrey, why are you crying? Dad, I got tackled on the field and my arm hurts. 
Come on, Jeffrey. Men don't cry. Now wipe those tears. Is this a microaggression? I'm not so sure about this one. What do you think, Rita? I'm not so sure either. Let's put no. Actually, telling a boy not to cry because men don't cry can be considered a microaggression for several reasons, including gender stereotypes. It reinforces harmful gender stereotypes that associate crying with weakness or femininity, suggesting that expressing emotions is not acceptable for boys or men. Two, invalidation. The statement invalidates and dismisses the genuine feelings and experiences of boys and men, and implies that their emotions are less valid or important compared to those of women. Now let's see our score. Since we got one of the scenes wrong, we have one black heart and two red hearts. We hope that this game will initiate classroom discussions on microaggressions, so we can make our classrooms more inclusive for all. Thank you. Those were wonderful. Uh, I, I know we can't see the rest of the attendees right now, but like I'm sure they're all clapping because those were all great presentations. Thank you all so much. Uh, I'm so honored to have you guys here with us. Uh, we do have one group, our prim group, who is in a time zone that just didn't make it great for tuning in. But otherwise, uh, we've got everybody here. Um, I'm going to start off with a question or two, but as a reminder to our attendees, throw your questions in the chat and we will get to them as we go along. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, first of all, I noticed a number of you talked about learner variability and some scaffolded experimentation when you create lessons. And I'm curious, what are some approaches or techniques that you've used when you feel like a learner might be um, ripe for some challenges or maybe to uh, re-engage a learner or make something a little bit uh, lower floor, lower barrier to entry for a learner who's struggling and looks like they might disengage. And uh, Harita and uh, Shrad, I, I know that you guys have a coding school yourself, so definitely also jump in uh, to this question, but uh, who would like to start us off? I'm happy to take this and go first. Um, so one thing that's really important when thinking about learner variability in general is to have a framing from an ability perspective rather than from a deficit mindset. So um, having multiple entry points in which a learner can engage with. So if that's thinking of providing some starter code that a learner can um, remix from or um, in the creative technology research lab that I'm a research assistant in, um, we think about also giving some code that's buggy or some code that's exploded, which is equivalent to a Parsons problem or even um, a spicy version. So for those who want a little extra challenge, giving different ways in which a student can um, enter the project is also a way to engage students in what you might think of that low floor, high ceiling and the, the visual that I gave with the reinforced corners and ladder as well. So definitely also keeping in mind just your framework as a, as a teacher in the room from an ability perspective rather than a deficit. I love that. Feel free to take it away. Anybody else have a thought? Uh, well, one of the things that I've noticed is that following a student's interests as much as possible. So a student who feels perhaps, oh, I can't code, I'm an artist allow an entry point into the exact the same concept of what you're trying to teach but using an art solution so they'll still learn functions for example but use something that that child feels confident in it really helps i love that uh in many of our boot camps we have students that come in from a bunch of different experience levels so I think making sure that everyone is engaged, especially the, the advanced coders, is really important. So we make sure that in our classes, we offer hacks that you can add to your games to make them more challenging, especially for students that have more experience towards Scratch. And we also make sure to give um, all the kids 
a little bit of creativity in their projects. So even if it's a guided project, we make sure that they can choose their characters, their sounds, their backdrops, mm -hmm. and they can experiment with the blocks that can change the colors. So for so we can keep all the kids like um, really entertained throughout the whole class. So another thing that we do is we want to ensure that our kids who are in our classes really understand the lesson that we're providing them. So what we do is we try to make hard concepts more relatable and to essentially portray them as things that they see in their daily lives. So maybe if you're thinking about a for loop or loops in general, you're like, oh, how about what you do every morning when we go to school? Because generally that's something that's consistent. So what we want to do is we really want to make sure our learners understand. And in the case that at the end of the class, we have a little bit of extra time, we want to allow students to like present the projects that they've made, talk about what little spins they've put on it, if they put anything on it. We'll also talk about like what they've learned because we want our students to know that every step in their journey to learning programming is fundamental. And by presenting it, we kind of allow them to talk more about what they learned in the class. So they're allowed to say what they've taken away. That's wonderful. I think, you know, one of the things I seem to pick up here was that the sort of personalization and creative expression, which I think are hallmarks of Scratch. And so, um, you know, especially with this last project that we just saw in microaggressions, how do you sort of uh, encourage learners to bring their passion and interests into what they create? Is it the, the type of st uh, project that they make, a game or an animation? Is it the subject matter? Is it the, the assets they choose? Um, do you find that, you know, when they can make it a little bit more personal, maybe they're more invested in the project? Uh, how do you encourage them to bring themselves into Scratch? Okay, so um, one of the ways that we encourage our learners to go into Scratch is we actually have some starter projects that we usually start off with. And one of them is like, write your name out in Scratch and add some like filters to it, make it more interesting than just the basic project. And we'll give our students a template. We'll teach them some basic steps that they can use, such as making the characters spin, making them increase in size and color. But for the most part, we want our students to customize them and let themselves be seen in their projects. And I think that's one of the best and the biggest things that our students take away from our classes is that coding isn't just about, oh, just learning a concept. It's also about applying yourself and seeing how you can use and express your interests in what you make. Yeah, I do think extending a lesson as much as possible. So having um, chunks where the students do a small piece of the project, but then they take the rest of it and they move forward and they can branch out to add things that they're interested in or additional coding concepts that they really enjoy. And that's great too. You get to see that customization. One of everything that uh, the other panelists have shared and talked about are all part of the inclusive framework, universal design for learning. And it's broken down into three different um, pillars. And the first one, um, multiple means of engagement has different checkpoints. And the checkpoint guideline seven is recruiting interest. And that focuses specifically on framing um, lessons and instruction around how learners can stay engaged based on their interests. And so even though we're not expressly saying that we're starting from the beginning with universal design in mind, what everyone has spoken about here is from a UDL perspective. And so in our Creating Pathways Meetup, what we discuss is how we might not realize that we're already designing with inclusion in mind, but just like everyone else has spoken about, we're already, we're saying a lot of these words or breaking tasks down into small chunks. Um, that's also part of um, engagement and even action and expression, thinking about like executive functioning for students. And so just wanted to throw that in there as well. Uh, in our classes, we usually try to fit at least two to three projects and usually they're different projects 
in the time that we are in the time that we have. So we can do one platformer game or one like story game. So we can give every child a niche and scratch, something that they find interesting, so they can continue doing that when they're not in our classes. I love this. I'm curious, um, you know, sometimes when coders come to Scratch, they're, they have some sort of an um, idea in mind about what would make their project a success. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think uh, the measure of success is maybe different than what we think about, or maybe it depends on each learner. So I'm curious, when you're working with your learners, how do you sort of help them measure success in, a, in an activity, or how do you... Uh, help them understand if it, the activity has been successful or the project has been successful well i'll start with this one um one of the things that we encourage as a lesson ends is for students to get together and share with each other so if they've made a quiz game for a math class say let your friend play the game while you play their game and look at how you changed it how is yours different how is it the same and then what can you do better? What can you do differently? And I think what really gets them thinking is we'll ask and we'll look for, how could you apply this same programming concept to another math concept? Like what other math concept can you use your program for? And that starts these really interesting end of project conversations. And it takes some of the pressure I think off of what grade did I get or what, you know, for schools. When I was a classroom teacher, um, one of the things that we worked on was having um, reflection journals. And in those reflection journals, we would set goals together. And so every student's goal looked very different because it was personalized to them. It met them where they were in their skill journey. Um, and that also goes back to one of those UDL checkpoints of guiding appropriate goal setting. So helping to provide prompts and scaffolds and resources. So when things get difficult, students have a way to go back and reflect and you as the teacher have a way to support them and give them time in pro appropriate feedback. So I think you know, checking in, having goal setting, giving feedback is all really, really important on um, a student's learning journey. I agree with that. And um, in most of our classes, we always make sure that the child types in the chat what they want their project to look like. So we can find a way to incorporate that into the final outcome of the project. So we base it off what the child wants to do. And at the end of class, if they want to add something to their, to their project that they don't know how to, they can always unmute and tell us and we'll always stay behind a little extra to help them. So that way they can feel successful about their own project. I think one of the biggest metrics for me to measure how successful an activity was, was to see if a learner felt like they learned something new if they felt like they made progress. So if they came to the class and they said, today I learned blank and I didn't even know that blank existed like it's completely new to me that is one of the biggest successes in an activity that I can ever measure and I think that learners always start off in different places especially in our classes we see people of many different skill levels but we want everyone to end up walking away with something new that they've done or something new that they've learned and that's the biggest successful outcome for me at least I love all of these answers and I love that like learning something new like is it can be like a perfect outcome, right? <laughs> it doesn't have to be even something big. Um, I, I always feel such a sense of joy when I've overcome a challenge or debug something and finally got something working or, um, you know, when somebody teaches me something and I, I can sort of replicate it. And so I, I love uh, making sure that they have that that sense of passion it doesn't have to be some sort of big grand uh thing it can sometimes just be these small wins and they add up uh, it sounds like um maybe in some of these spaces there's some uh, uh, availability for collaboration or play when you're creating an activity like this and um you know we as a facilitator may be trying to help the student um learn something but sometimes 
maybe they want to teach us something, which is awesome. And I, I think is empowering, but also when you teach, sometimes you learn as well, right? Uh, but also just this ability to do, rely on each other and to work off of others' skills. So the facilitator isn't the only, you know, the expert in the room, right? Sometimes they look at us as experts when we may not be, you know, we're learners just like them. So I'm curious, um, what do you see as the role of collaboration and play uh, when you're when you're doing these activities? And, uh, you know, also trying to level set for maybe a classroom where there's different um, experience levels, different, you know, different strength points between your students. How does collaboration come into this? Okay, uh, so I feel that collaboration and activities is probably one of the most influential things I've seen in my classes at least. So oftentimes when we have larger classes and there's only one instructor per class, when we're going through the questions that some of our students may have, another student actually comes in and they see their uh, fellow student is waiting for you know an instructor to get to their question. And they said, oh, have you tried this step instead? Or have you looked at that? That might be causing your issue. And oftentimes we see that by collaborating with one another, the students are able to actually resolve their own problems. And I've seen students who have questions with their code. Sometimes one student may have a question with one part, another student may have a question with another part. And they discuss with one another a little bit and say, hey, I don't know about this portion of my code. It's giving me an error. Um, this part of your code seems to work. Do you like know anything about this? And students are so open to asking questions and talking with one another. That's how collaboration just looks in these classes. Yeah, I agree. I think debugging is a natural collaborative effort. Um, they, love, they love to help each other that way. I think also designing some lessons and some programs to be pair programming. So um, if you want to make, say, a band, you know, like a, and you want that to be collaborative, you want maybe three people and one person is going to code the drums and one person, and they can feed off of each other. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for those types of collaborations where the actual program itself and the objectives for the lesson require or lend themselves to collaboration. I think sometimes too, students are afraid of the open-endedness that comes along with play. And so guiding them and modeling for them what play looks like and how the ability to test and fail and make mistakes is okay and letting them call out your mistakes in front of the whole class um, helps build that perseverance and persistence. There's another set of um, instructional pedagogies called high leverage practices that are put together by the Council of Exceptional Children. And they're broken down into these different categories. There's um, social emotional, collaborative, um, instructional and assessment. And in the uh, social emotional HLP, there are 22 of them total, and they're each broken down in those other categories. In the social emotional uh, category, HLP 9 is teaching social behaviors. And so it's explicitly teaching and modeling how to have appropriate interpersonal skills and communication and self management that align with lessons. And these the HLPs are put together specifically for students with disabilities, but these are just really great practices that all children need help with. Um, and then going back to what Cindy said about debugging, how that lends itself often to a great place for, um, for collaboration and pair programming um, in, in the instructional um, HLPs, HLP um, 14 is teaching cognitive and metacognitive strategies to support learning and independence, which is right where debugging fits in. So mm -hmm. using all these resources that as educators, we might not think about, particularly as computer science educators, they're just really great pedagogical approaches and in instruction. I love that. 
Um, I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any questions at the moment. Make sure that if you have questions, you're putting them in the session chat. I think that's how I get to see them. Um, not the event chat. I think there was sometimes some confusion in some previous sessions. But um, I'll just keep kind of rolling since we we're talking about debugging, which is my favorite topic. I always like to ask, um, do you have some debugging strategies that you, your learners, um, use when things are working as expected that you found to be um, helpful? Give me your favorite debugging. <laughs> A debugging walk where, especially for younger students, so uh, when I was in the classroom, I taught K to six. When you've got young learners, it helps to physically have them stand up and move. Um, and I think this actually applies to older students, even high school students. Um, if they can enact the code step by step physically, it may help them. And scratch, this specifically applies to scratch because a lot of the animations have motion in them. Um, the other option, of course, is to talk through it. But I do believe uh, physically getting up and moving can make all the difference for younger students, especially K to three, K to four. That's fun, I like that. Yeah. So um, in our lab, one of our National Science Foundation funded projects is called U UDL for CS, Universal Design for Learning for Computer Science. And um, I think there's gonna be a link dropped in the chat for everyone. Um, we have a website with a ton of resources that have um, multiple things that I've mentioned throughout the session, but one of them is called the debugging detective that allows students to think through the directions that the teacher provides and it gives some strategies. Can you get unstuck from asking the teacher from the programmer software, maybe if you had a worksheet from a peer, from an anchor chart, and that's the first half of the sheet, and it's a digital tool. And then the second part is how you think about your code. What did you want your code to actually do? And you can upload and take a picture. What happened when you ran your code? Can you read your code block by block? Does any part of it work? Do I know which part is um, causing a problem. And so going through the debugging detective, and there's so many ways you could take this and remix this to make this work for your setting. Um, I think we've seen um, uh, bulletin boards of debugging detectives and whatnot. So lots of different opportunities there for folks to um, get creative with this resource. Very fun. I grew up loving mysteries. So I always say like, it, you know, this is like reading a Sherlock Holmes mystery sometimes when I'm reading my code. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, do either of you have a favorite strategy? Yeah, usually in online class, it's a little bit harder to actually debug code with some students since I'm not actually face to face with them and it's just through a computer screen. But I actually think that when a student runs into a problem, it makes a, it makes a better relationship between the instructor and the student because the student has to speak up and say, hey, I don't think my code is working. And they have to share their screen and then they have to walk me through the code that they've written so far. So that makes a better relationship between me, the instructor and the student themselves, because now we've actually talked to each other and we've talked about what they don't feel comfortable with in the code and what they think the problem is. And we just kind of walk it through from there. So carrying on from that, um, in our classes, we try to make sure our curriculum itself is that we walk students step by step through a project. So after and by step, it's like you put together a small segment of the code. And then I would ask, OK, so when you guys feel like you have these blocks put together, just let me know. And then afterwards, if you guys do encounter any problems, so if something is not being put together properly, something isn't working, tell me. So because of this, we actually kind of know already where the problem might be when they're actually looking at their code. And oftentimes, as a consequence, many students can actually tackle their problem because they can see, hey, I know that everything was working before I got to this step and suddenly it's not working anymore. So it has to be the new blocks I added in. 
and then they're able to see from there okay now where can i go and then also we're always here and the other students in the classroom are always willing to help out in case that um you know one of us is already working with someone else and that's just how we um, debug in our class and also a really helpful tip is if you know that it the, like code stops running on one line and that one line looks really right to you just look at the line above or the next few lines above because usually that's where the problem is unless it's like two different structures but usually it's like one big chunk of code so students are able to tell it's somewhere within this vicinity i see there's a note in the in the chat which is great which someone's uh cat says we use sounds throughout the code to help kids identify where uh the code where in the code the bug might be i i, I think i can picture this that you're kind of building sounds throughout so if you're hitting certain trigger points you know okay it was working up until you know the hay or whatever and and now it stopped working so so now i know where to start looking i uh i have my little um on my desk i have my little rubber duck Ooh, he's hard to see but uh I, I remember being told when i started coding that if you got stuck you talk to the duck and so mm -hmm. I, when i don't have anybody else here to talk to i, I talk to him um this is this is great I, I think that um one of the things that um i always wonder about is as as the facilitator um you know sometimes people expect you to just maybe provide answers, but that's not exactly the great pathway to learning, right? So as a facilitator, when you're doing activities, how do you see your your role in this? What do you see as your, um, do you have any advice about, you know, how to facilitate activities, things that you found successful to encourage that tinkering, that play, um, and, you know, that struggling a bit because that struggling is actually kind of a superpower sometimes you you feel so good when you when you figure it out right <laughs> so facilitation tips i guess from a um, tinkering learning perspective i think i think, uh, I don't know, you can, I think <laughs> multiple entries uh pathway again is a really great idea again small chunks and more than one way for the students to come at the challenge. So, you know, if the challenge is, um, you know, to build some sort of museum type interactive map, then you want to give them two or three options so that if they don't, if they're not successful with option number one, my response as a teacher would have been, oh, tell me what other steps you tried. And so as a teacher, if I offer three entry points to a project, they have to have tried all three, <laughs> you know, so it helps them avoid the go get the answer option. Okay, so to, to pick up, um, what we do when we are helping our students debug their code is we ask them, when did it stop working? around what step because sometimes students might be hesitant to say i have a question or something wasn't working in advance so it's always good to ask them ahead of time you know when when did it stop working so you know where the issue might be and then after that what we usually do is like we trace our students through their program so we say so what steps have we taken since it stopped working? What have we been adding since it stopped working? So then they tell us what, what's what been going into the program. Like what have they been adding? And then as they walk us through the steps, they also look at our code and they look at their code. So they have like a mirror here. And they're thinking, well, I was good till here and here. And then, oh, this might not be right. I may have had the number wrong or this texture might be off or something around those lines. And then they're able to see where the issue is themselves without us really contributing too much. So they're able to find the problem on their own. Yeah, reading someone else's code is a powerful skill and being able to sort of break down sometimes can be really helpful. Yeah, bouncing off what Harita said, when, when we're doing debugging, we usually do it as a conversation between me and my student rather than like a teacher just telling you exactly what's wrong like oh that block is wrong so instead we're like oh maybe the maybe the mistake is in the last three blocks of the code and the student's like oh you're right maybe this block looks a little suspicious let's change it out like we 
we tackle the problem and more of like me kind of helping them out, giving them little hints instead of me directly telling them what's wrong with the code. Yeah, I also really love being silly in front of the students <laughs> as a strategy, um, just to show them that you can't take yourself too seriously sometimes. And so um, one of the first projects I like to do when I introduce Scratch with second graders is um, the dance party, or it has a lot of variations in names um, from the creative computing curriculum. and. I'll say to them, you know, like, how are we going to make the scratch cat move? And then they'll, they'll tell me some suggestions and then I'll start trying to dance. And as we're walking through it and they're thinking through the steps and telling me it's more that they're directing the lesson and I'm just physically representing what should be happening. So it's also bringing in the unplugged way of how things should be happening and before we get plugged as well. Um, so I like doing a lot of silly things with them um, in all grade levels, even because um, I taught pre-K to fifth grade, even the fifth graders really appreciate that kind of environment. It makes it really light and fun and makes them feel like it's okay. We're not, we're not you know, going to, making mistakes is gonna feel good. Um, and also one of the tricks I learned from my mentor, Dr. Maya Israel, is using I can statements with students, um, saying and either having it explicitly posted as a anchor chart or having it as like a little printout on their desks. So if the concept is using conditionals, having them say, I can use a conditional in X way or um, however we're going about it. And then using thumbs up that they got something right, medium that they're not quite getting getting it or thumbs down that they're totally lost as like a check-in point. So again, it's the role of the facilitator more to assist than um, direct instruct all the time. I, I love this. Um, and as Ben pointed out in the chat, making mistakes is going to feel good. We all, I think we all agree, like it may not feel good in the moment, but when you get, you know, to the other side of that moment or when you are, you um, when you sort of wiggled out the issue, it feels super great. <laughs> um, I, I think for me personally, when I would go into a classroom, sometimes at the start when I was first using it, I thought, well, I have to be, I have to be an expert, right? I have to know what I'm doing. And I found some of our greatest breakthroughs and moments were when I was doing something on the big screen, which is intimidating, right? When you're doing a code along and something doesn't quite go right. And then the students are able to jump in and help you know, and they feel great and I learned something. And so it's almost a bonus to go in sometimes without necessarily an expectation of how it will go or what the final product will be and sort of let them lead you through the activity. Uh, and and I think that feels really empowering. Um, so I love this. Uh, I will say we've got five minutes left, right? Five minutes. Um, I don't see anything in the, in, the, in the chat still. So I'm just going to keep pegging you guys with questions. But I guess for maybe our, our last um, question. I'm curious, um, when, you are, uh, when you are working on a project, um, you know, why, why pick some of the topics that you, that you do? Why, why were you interested on, you know, in giving um, a presentation on this topic? Why do you feel like it was important to share here today? Um, and, uh, and, and how do you, uh, why do you feel like this is such an important topic to make sure to, to pair with Scratch? Share your passion. <laughs> well, I'll say for me, I've been part of the Scratch educator community since 2011. And um, I have felt that this is such a supportive and inclusive community. And as I've moved throughout my career as a CS teacher and then moving now into the research space, I found that there's little gaps in how we think about equity and inclusion. And um, 
while the Scratch Educator Meetup has been such a supportive place for me as an educator to learn strategies for teaching Scratch, I want us to think a little bit more broadly about how what equity and inclusion really means. And so for me, that's my research focus. Um, and so I wanted to give back what I'm learning in that space. Love it. And for me, I actually chose civics and social studies because we're always looking for ways to make those subjects fun. Um, students often read or there'll be a video and um, to be practical, those are not typically tested subjects in elementary school. Um, and so sometimes the end of a unit project, it might start to look the same after you've done three or four different projects. The other thing is to tie it into career options and real life so if you make the interactive map um, and then you go to a museum or an interactive, you make a timeline, then you go to a museum where you're standing in front of a display and you're pressing buttons and it is moving along the display, it gives students a way to see themselves in that future. Hey, I made one of those at school, mom. Um, or you go on a class trip and they see a grown up version of what they created. Um, whether it's an animation, whether it's one of these interactive kiosks, and then they might believe that they can become the kinds of people who do that when they grow up. So in regards to why we chose our topic of microaggressions, my sister and I are from Jersey City, and that is one of the most diverse cities in the U.S. And because of this, we have the privilege of being surrounded by so much diversity and so much culture, and we've been able to engage in so many different events and so many different cultures, and our school particularly embraces diversity as well. But even though we are surrounded by so much diversity, many people in our city are also within their own groups. So because of this, what happens is that even though you are cognizant and aware of diversity, you may be suspect to some omitted angles. You may not understand the perspective of another person and how they may perceive certain statements and certain gestures. And that's why the whole topic of microaggressions came up between me and my sister. We were discussing it because we were saying that many people may mistakenly say something, they may not even realize that their statement is hurtful, that it could be harmful to someone of another group because they're not necessarily in that group. And because of this, they may leave that person feeling hurt and that could contribute to psychological distress. So because of this, what we wanted to do was to introduce these omitted angles and these different perspectives through a story on Scratch. And we know that Scratch is one of the best mediums to convey stories and a gamified version that makes it easy for younger students to understand. Yeah, I believe Scratch is such an easy way for kids to accurately understand what's happening. Because if you just preach to them about microaggressions and difficult topics, they won't, it'll go what in one ear and out the other. They won't understand it. But when we put it in a gamified way, like Karita said, it's a lot easier for them to observe a scenario and interpret it in the way that they feel is right. And then they can choose whether it's right or not. And then they can get an explanation of why their choice was wrong or right. Scratch offers them an easy way to understand difficult situations. I love this. And and I know we're we're wrapping here in a moment, but I will also say one of the things I I appreciate about Scratch is this ability to remix. So if uh, someone else has thought about a microaggression that they feel like should have been it's part of your project, they can remix and make their version and add, you know, their two points or to Cindy's point, like you're making a, a project on civics or social studies or something. And oh, I have this cool thing that I just learned that I want to let other people know, too. You can remix a project and build upon it and kind of keep that knowledge um, growing. So um, thank you all for being here with me today. This is a really great talk. Uh, getting some praise in the chat, but really appreciate your time and um, excited to see all the other uh, stuff from you all in the future. I hope you have, have a great rest of conference, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much.